time for me uh, and honor for me to invite uh, Rabbi Hanan Schlesinger. He serves as the executive director and community rabbinic scholar for the Jewish Studies Initiative of North, of North Texas, which he founded in 2010. Prior to that, he had been with the community Kodel of Dallas for five years, first as Rosh Kodel, meaning educational director, and later as director of community education and community rabbinic, 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 rabbinic scholar. Rabbi Schlesinger is a member of the Rabbinic, Rabbinical Council of America and Inter International Rabbinic Fellowship, as well as the Rabbinic Association of Greater Dallas. He is presently the recipient of a Rabbis Without, Rabbis Without Borders Fellowship, sponsored by the National Jewish Center for Learning and Leadership. Rabbi Schlesinger divides his time between Dallas and Israel. He and his Israeli-born wife Ayala have four grown children and three grandchildren, all of whom reside in Israel. This is his rookie year teaching at University of North Texas. And ladies and gentlemen, please join me welcoming Rabbi Schlesinger for his speech. Good evening, everyone. It's a real, real pleasure to be. I think this is wonderful. I'm almost in the verge of tears. Uh, some of you know the, uh, the difficulties we had in arranging this event and the opposition we've encountered. The fact that we finally are able here to sit together, uh, to break bread together, to get to know each other, and to get it, to know each other's uh, religions and cultures, I think, is exactly what the world needs right now. And I really, really want to thank our hosts. If I were to try to name all of the friends I've, uh, I've met, I would miss someone. But I do have to mention one person, which is Musa, who is my original contact, and I just love him. <laughs> and I've met just so many other friends here who have uh, been instrumental uh, in arranging this, the leaders of your uh, Islamic Association, I really, really, really uh, express my great appreciation. From our side, I just want to acknowledge that a number of the members of the board of my organization, the Jewish Studies Initiative of North Texas, are here. I just want to acknowledge David Radunsky and Caroline Hopkinson. <laughs> and I also see Jim Panapinto here and Todd, Todd Cohen. That's most of our board. And lastly, I have to, I have to, and I want to express deep appreciation to uh, Rochelle Weisscrane, <laughs> who is the uh, director of the Jewish uh, Life and Learning at the Jewish Community Center. And even though we couldn't have this event at the Jewish Community Center, she is here, and she has arranged so much of what went on tonight. So. I want to try in 20 minutes to say something about Judaism. That's hard. So we'll begin with this. I want to try and explain who are we, or what are we, we Jews? What box can you put us in? How can you uh, understand what we are? So first of all, it's clear that we're members of a religion, Judaism, but it's much, much more than that. There's additional factors that we have to try to get our, our arms around. So you might think that we're an ethnic group, like uh, the Turks are an ethnic group, but that really doesn't work. Because I, I see black Jews, and there's Oriental Jews, and there's Caucasian Jews. So it's hard to really say that we're an ethnic group. There are Jews from the Middle East, and Jews that look Asian. It's not exactly that. Now, there are those who would say that the Jews are a nation, and there's some truth in that. But on the other hand, nations usually have all of their members living in one place, in one landmass, and Jews are scattered all over the world, so we can't really be a, a nation. Well, today we have our own country in Israel, but we haven't had that until 1948. We didn't have our own country. So it's hard to say that we're a nation. What We'd like to say the easiest way to put our, to wrap our brains around is to say that we are a people. 
We're the Jewish people. We're an extended family. We really see each other no matter what culture we're from, no matter what ethnic group we're from, no matter what degree we observe the religion or not, we see ourselves as an extended family. And if I understand correctly, and you'll correct me later if I'm wrong, <laughs> it's different in that sense than it is with the Muslims. One of the first things that uh, Musa told me when we met, I hope I'm not revealing any secrets I shouldn't reveal, I think he said that he doesn't feel that much affinity with certain Muslims in Pakistan or in Saudi Arabia. Did I get that right? Kind of. Uh, you have a common religion, but perhaps you don't have a common culture. Perhaps you don't feel as a family with all Muslims around the world. So with Jews, it, it's different. And not only do we share the same religion and the same Hebrew language, we have the same historical experience. Not only experience of the past, but hopes for the future. We have the same history and heritage. We also feel we're bound up with the same fate. Jews around the world feel responsible for one another. We feel bound up with other Jews wherever they are. We're woven together, the Jewish people, within a tapestry that transcends time and space in a fashion that could only be described as one big extended family. And that family goes back 3,000 years to the patriarch, the patriarch Ibrahim, Avraham in Hebrew, Abraham, and the matriarch Sarah. But actually in a certain sense, as far as the, the ideas for the Jewish family, we go back even further than Avraham and Sarah. We go back to creation. We go back to creation. We believe that the Jewish people have a special role to play in the unfolding of world history. You see, according to our understanding, God created the world, God created mankind, God created mankind with free will, with the ability to choose between good and evil. And very soon after creation, man exercised his free will to do evil, and the world quickly degenerated. And humankind experienced fratricide and other forms of murder, sexual perversion, theft, and many forms of violence. And God was deeply, deeply perturbed. And he had no choice say our holy writings, but to destroy the world with a flood and then to begin again. But unfortunately, that didn't help that much for the world quickly returned to its former evil. And then God came up with an alternative plan to create a people, an extended family, that would model righteous living for the rest of humanity. He would enter into a covenant with them, we call it a Hebrew Brit, and would provide them with a guide for the moral and the upright life. They would be held to a higher standard, which would serve them always as a beacon. And that standard they would constantly develop and study, passing it on to their children and to their descendants and to generations to come. They would be this people that God would create, that God would choose. They would be a blessing to the world and a light unto the nations, a light which would shine forth and would gradually, over the course of centuries and millennia, provide a moral compass for the rest of the world and would help all of humanity to raise themselves up to higher and higher levels of human living. And so, we believe that is the background to the creation of the Jewish people. God created the Jewish people and he gave us the law that we call the Torah, and I heard Torah mentioned in the presentation we heard earlier. God gave us the Torah, which we also call the five books of Moses. And these five books constitute the first five of the 24 books of the Hebrew scripture, of the Jewish Bible. Now, living according to the Torah is hard stuff. It's quite demanding. It requires that at least to a certain degree, Jews keep themselves separate from the rest of the world. Now from time immemorial, we have refrained therefore from intermarriage, 
We have lived in separate communities or separate neighborhoods, centered around our synagogues. We have schooled our children in our own educational frameworks. And many of us in this room are still proud to live according to these high standards and to make the Herculean efforts necessary to maintain our uniqueness and to pass it on to future generations. Now, although serving as a beacon to the world is our ultimate purpose, that first requires, before we worry about others seeing our light, it first requires that we keep that light strong and that we ensure the flame will never go out. Now, practically speaking, and this is all the more so the case in a world in which Jews are so persecuted and so attacked and maligned, we are primarily focused inward on our own extended family. Our thoughts are on how to strengthen the cohesiveness of the extended family and how to pass the torch on to the next generation. How to personally live up to the exemplary standards that the Torah sets for us. And our holidays focus almost exclusively on our particular sacred history and our hopes for the redemption of the Jewish people. But there's one season during the Jewish year when we Jews expand the purview of our thoughts and look beyond the Jewish people. One season when we divert our gaze from the trees to the forest, to the big picture that deals with our place, the place of the Jews within the broad expanse of God's creation. And that one season when we move from thinking about the trees to thinking about the forest, that one season is upon us right now. It's the season that we Jews call the high holidays or the days of awe, beginning with Rosh Hashanah and culminating in Yom Kippur. Now I have to give some background. I have to backtrack. We Jews live according to two different flows of time, two different cycles of celebration, two different sets of holidays. On the one hand, we have what's called the pilgrimage festivals, and I put on the tables a few, on each table, sheets you can take home that I think mention there these three pilgrimage festivals. It begins, and the order is important here, they begin with Passover, and Passover is in the spring, always in the spring. Passover celebrates the beginning of Jewish history, the birth of the Jewish people when we went out of the womb of Egypt and became, or at least began to become, an independent nation. And the second of the three pilgrimage festivals that celebrate milestones in particular Jewish history the second festival, the second pilgrimage festival, is Shavuot, when we celebrate the events 50 days after the exodus from Egypt, when we received our Torah, our constitution, our guiding light from God at Mount Sinai. And I also heard a certain mention of that in the presentation that we merited to hear earlier. And lastly, the third of the pilgrimage festivals, and this one's not in the spring, and not in the summer, but rather in the fall, the third of the pilgrimage festivals is, of course, Sukkot, when we sit in booths in Sukkot, in little huts outside of our house for seven days, in memory of the trek of the Israelites through the Sinai Desert for 40 years after receiving the Torah and before entering the land of Israel. That cycle of time, from Passover to Shavuot, to Sukkot, celebrating, commemorating, and marking particular Jewish history, that's one side of the coin. But then, there's this other set of holidays that I alluded to earlier, the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, they're also mentioned on the sheets.